Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to wherever you are joining us from around the world. It's great to see everyone logging in and settling in for today's Biogal webinar, Canine Babesiosis, a challenge for veterinarians, presented by Professor Oliva Gaetano. It's great to have you all logging in. Uh, I can see lots of people joining in from around the world. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, we look forward to today's presentation. I have a few things to go through before I introduce Professor Oliva. The first is that there are live translations available for today's webinar. You should be able to see an option for interpretations on your Zoom menu. If you click on that, you will see there are options for live Portuguese, Spanish or Turkish translations. So you can click on those, select your language of choice, and you will have live translations for today's webinar. I need to ask everybody as well to please send us your questions while we are going through the webinar today. Could we ask that you please use the Q&A button? If you have a look on your Zoom uh, menu, you will see there is an option for Q&A. If you place your questions into the Q&A box, they will be recorded. We will be presenting some live questions to Dr. Oliver at the end of today's webinar. Don't worry if your question isn't answered today. All of the questions that are put into the Q&A box will be recorded and presented to Dr. Oliver later. He will answer those questions and they will be sent along with the recording of today's webinar a few days in a few days time. So please put all questions into the Q&A box, please not into the chat please use the Q&A box so that we can make sure that your questions are recorded and presented to Dr. Oliver for him to answer either at the end of today's session or later on uh, in written format, which you will get along with the recording and your certificate for today's webinar. Today's webinar is uh, hosted by Biogal. Biogal is a manufacturer of veterinary diagnostic tools. The company has developed several product lines that allow vets to detect a variety of small animal diseases in-house from the comfort of their clinic or lab. Their products are supplied to more than 50 countries around the world, and Biogal provides excellent educational tools and veterinary updates. Please do visit biogal.com to learn more about their products. My name is Jessica Case. I am the manager of Complete Veterinary Care. We are proud to be the UK distributors for Biogal. If you have any questions about the UK distribution, uh, distribution of the Biogal products, please email us at info at cbcgroup.co.uk and we would be happy to help. On today's webinar, Professor Oliver Gaetano will discuss canine babesiosis. This session will include discussions about species overview, related infections and immune status, symptoms and signs of clinical illness, diagnostic evaluation methods and treatments. Professor, Professor Oliver graduated from the Naples Faculty of Veterinary Medicine. His research interests include the pathogenesis, diagnosis, prevention and treatment of veterinary and zoonotic vector-borne diseases, especially canine leishmaniasis. Besides being a member of the Italian SCIVAC group, for studying canine leishmaniasis, he is also a founding member of the Leash Vet Group for standardizing the diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of canine leishmaniasis. Professor Oliver has extended research collaborations with the High Institute of Health in Rome, in particular the Department of Vector-Borne Diseases and International Health Department of Infectious, Parasitic, and Immune-Mediated Diseases which developed preventative strategies against canine and human, human leishmaniasis. He is considered the most relevant European expert on canine vector-borne diseases. Professor Olivia Oliver was the head of the veterinary faculty of Naples from 2016 to 2021. And today he is the head of the veterinary teaching hospital of the faculty. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Oliver now we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. We will have questions afterwards, but for now, I will hand over to, Dr. Uh, to Professor Oliver. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you to Biogal for the, this kind invitation uh, to this uh, seminar on canine babesiosis. And the title is uh, a challenge for veterinarians because uh, in many cases, canine babesiosis is really a challenge for all the colleagues. Uh, I would like also to thanks after Biogal, uh, also Professor Gard Banet uh, from Hebrew University, Israel, uh, because some materials of this lecture have been kindly provided from Gard uh, because of our longtime friendship and the scientific collaboration. So once again, thanks to Biogal and thanks to Gard. What about Babesia? Babesia are, are very complex uh, hemoparasites that are transmitted by ticks to mammals or birds. And they belong to the order pyroplasmida because of their particular shape. Uh, in fact, during uh, their intraerythrocytic parasite stage, they assume a shape like a pear. So in Italy, for example, we call pera is the same uh, word of the Greek uh, language. So like the fluid, peer. Uh, some notice about the history, because the first that recognized the Babesia was uh, Victor Babes, and the name was uh, because of Victor Babes, a Romanian pathologist that first described the causative agent of the febrile hemoglobinuria in cattle. And uh, it is uh, uh, for us very important that can canine babesiosis uh, was uh, reported in Europe for the first time in Italy in 1895. And then uh, Theobald Smith, an American medical doctor, uh, described the life cycle of Babesia bigemina, that uh, initially was called uh, Pyroplasma bigeminum, that caused the cattle disease that we know as, uh, uh, sorry, as uh, Texas fever. Uh, and it was the first time uh, in which an arthropod was associated with the transmission of an infectious disease. So it was very important uh, that they described the involvement of an arthropod in the transmission of an infectious disease. And it is very important to recognize also that babesiosis may affect humans. The first case was uh, documented in uh, Croatia uh, at the time uh, was uh, called Yugoslavia in 1957. Uh, uh, there was a case in uh, a spanectomized farmer and the, uh, the pathogen at that time was described as Babesia bovis, uh, probably it was Babesia divergence and it was a fatal infection. So the first case of human babesiosis was a fatal infection. What about the life cycle of Babesia? It's a very complex uh, life cycle. I will try uh, to describe in a few words. The, the, the main actor is a tick. You can see here in the red circle, an infected ticks uh, that harbor uh, the sporozoite form that are transmitted during the blood meal uh, in a vertebrate you can see here horses, uh, cattle, sheep, but today we will discuss of uh, a dog and the sporozoid form in, into the erythrocytes uh, assume the form of merozoids and replicate into the erythrocytes. And this uh, replication uh, also generate some gametocyte infected erythrocyte that 
could be ingested uh, during a blood meal uh, of another non-infected ticks. And in the ticks, there is a complex cycle uh, in which the gametes fuse into the tick midgut and turn into a zygote form, or we call also orchinate stage that invades the gut epithelium. And after uh, this stage, there is a subsequent intracellular asexual, we have many asexual replication that results in the formation of primary kinase that in case of Babesia invade old tissue of the tick. And there is a generation of secondary kinase that invade salivary glands and in salivary glands, there is a metamorphosis of a kinase that uh, transforms this, their cell in uh, sporozoid forms that are injected again into a new vertebrate during a blood meal closing the cycle. So a very complex uh, cycle that uh, is uh, uh, all, all for the, the whole stage in the tick. And very important that in Babesia sensu stricto, uh, the kinase can invade the tick ovaries and hex, uh, so they can pass into the next tick generation. So in ticks, we have the transovarial transmission. And depending on the species, kinase will develop in the sporozoid into the larvae or in the nymph salivary glands. So we have the, the closure of the whole cycle in, in the tick. So when we discuss of reservoir, we have to remember that ticks are reservoir because they can close the cycle and they uh, may transmit through the transovarial transmission uh, directly to the eggs and then to larvae and uh, the nymph. So it's very, very important to remember this, this situation. And we discussed of Babesia sensu stricto. What do we intend for Babesia sensu stricto? The classification of Babesia species is very complex. They are uh, distinguished in different clade and all uh, the, the species that are important for dogs belong to the clade six. We have also some example or in the clade two, but we will discuss of that. But in my presentation, I will point out mainly on the Babesia sensu strictus of clade six that comprise Babesia bogeli, Babesia canis, Babesia rossi, uh, that we uh, call large form Babesia, uh, Rongelia vitali, uh, that is uh, mainly confined in South America. And we have a small form of Babesia in the clade six that we call Babesia gibsoni. Then we have other small form of Babesia, uh, mainly Babesia negevi, uh, that is only confined till now in Israel, Babesia conrade, Babesia vulpes, uh, small form of Babesia uh, that are not classified as, as Babesia sensu stricto. So not belong to the clade six. But in my presentation, uh, also because by experience, I will focus on Babesia vogelai and Babesia canis and on Babesia uh, gibsoni. It is also important, important to recognize that Babesia negevi uh, for the first time was isolated in some uh, soft ticks. So ticks that usually um, attack birds 
and it is the first demonstration of uh, the isolation of Babesia in uh, the uh, soft ticks. So we can distinguish in large form of Babesia and small form of Babesia. So the typical shape of pill is uh, typical from large form of Babesia, uh, while the small form of Babesia has a different shape, an annular uh, small shape in the, into the erythrocytes. Here again, some description of uh, large Babesia. Uh, these slides are from uh, GAD uh, here, large form of Babesia. In this case, is Babesia vogelii. is clearly uh, distinguished uh, during a blood smear. And here, a small form of Babesia, again, the annual, the ring shape, annual shape of Babesia gibbs. Very important, we have also to remember that there is also possibility of uh, transmission, not only through the ticks, but also by blood transfusion. Again, I have to remember the transmission uh, the transovarial transmission from the ticks to the eggs, but also the vertical transmission from the beach to the puppies. So uh, there, there is an ancillary uh, way of transmission uh, appear very important. So please remember blood transfusion and vertical transfusion, vertical transmission, in, into the beach. And only till now, only or Babesia Gibsonai, also the direct transmission through the bite, through the fighting between uh, dogs. We will again point out on this, uh, on this uh, particular way of uh, transmission. Here you can see the distribution of uh, Babesia uh, all around the world. And in Europe, we are assisting to the spread of uh, Babesia and Gibsonai, but is coming from Asia, but is spreading in the Europe, but also in the uh, US and also in Latin America. Babesia vogelii is uh, well recognized in uh, American countries, but also in Africa, also in uh, Europe, in Asia, all around the world. And also Babesia canis is uh, uh, mainly in uh, Europe and in uh, Southeast Asia. What about uh, the Babesia gibsoni, small form of Babesia? Babesia gibsoni, first occurring in Asia is spreading all around the world and probably due to its particular way of uh, transmission. A Spanish study demonstrate that uh, there is a prevalence of 2% uh, in uh, 153 uh, dogs from uh, Barcelona area. And uh, there is also a more recent Italian study, it was performed in my institute, uh, the group of parasitologists of uh, my faculty, that examined uh, 1,311 uh, randomly selected healthy dogs. So please, uh, um, I would like to stress that were healthy dogs in which uh, we confirmed the presence of the parasite in 0.2% uh, of uh, this large group of uh, dogs. So uh, we, we have also frequent detection of a clinical case in all the Balkanic and Central uh, Europe countries. Uh, and the most frequent infected dogs belong to the dog 
fighting breeds, a, a main pit bull uh, terrier breed. What about the disease? Uh, I um, um, called my presentation a challenge for veterinarians because the infection of dogs by Babesia uh, species results in very varying clinical presentation, uh, depending on many factors. Obviously, first the species, uh, but also the age of dogs, the immune status. Uh, but please, I will stress also uh, the, the particular concomitant infection of the affected animals. And we have to remember that among large Babesia, Babesia rossi uh, appears the most pathogenetic. But please remember that it is uh, just localized in South Africa and uh, in, in some counties around South Africa, uh, while Babesia bogelites results mainly in subclinical or mild disease. And we have also to remember that small Babesia pathogenicity is currently under investigation. However, we know that Babesia bogeli may give severe disease. Here, you have an example of what usually happen during a concomitant infection. Here you can see a classical clinical case of uh, lesbaniosis. You can see some particular and typical lesion, uh, skin or mucocutaneous, uh, skin lesion, mucocutaneous and skin lesion of a dog with uh, lesbaniosis. Here uh, you can easily isolate it the Lismania in this dog, but please, in this dog, uh, because of many relapses during the treatment of the dog with the Lismaniosis, we checked for other parasites and we uh, isolated Babesia bogeli. Why? Because the concomitant uh, co-infection may give uh, immune, may contribute to the immune depression. So it is very, very important during, uh, in general, canine vector bone diseases, it is very important to um, check for uh, co-pathogens or co-infection in case of uh, many relapses, in case of uh, the, when the treatment is not effective. So please uh, check always for co-infection. What about the general clinical manifestation of Babesia infection? Uh, it is not typical. We have not a, a pathogenetic or um, typical clinical signs. We have anorexia, we can have a fever, we can have lymph adenomegaly, we can have obviously the spleen enlargement, but one of the most important um, clinical signs that we have to point out because it's different from other um, canine vector mold diseases is the presence of icterus. Icterus is probably one of the clinical signs that we uh, only recognize during Babesia infection. Obviously, in the chronic stage, we can have uh, weight loss or weakness. And another very important feature is the hemolytic anemia. And in many cases, mainly in acute cases, we can have example of regenerative anemia. But please, uh, this is not um, always the same because in um, many subclinical or chronic uh, clinical case, we cannot have uh, regenerative anemia. So it is not mandatory to have hemolytic anemia to have the suspicion of babesiosis. It is very important to remember. 
obviously in very acute uh, um, cases, but it is mainly for Babesia rossi, we can have also uh, cerebral babesiosis, or in some cases of uh, Babesia kinase, uh, which we have acute cases. Then uh, please remember also the renal involvement, uh, mainly, uh, mainly during uh, co-infection. Here, a classical example of regenerative anemia. Uh, here, you can see the anisocytosis, uh, so the different shape of uh, the, um, the erythrocytes, uh, in which you can also recognize some small form of Babesia, in this case, Babesia vulpes. What about the pathogenesis? Babesiosis uh, has a, a fascinous pathogenesis because after the uh, invasion, uh, they live uh, directly uh, within the cytoplasm of the erythrocyte. So Babesia evolved highly intricate means to escape the host immune defense by antigenic variation. There is a, a complicated and continuous antigenic variation to escape the host immune response. And uh, is a very a particular mechanism uh, for which Babesia causes the appearance of uh, the adhesive protuberances on the surface of infected erythrocytes that provoke their sequestration in capillaries just to avoid the destruction of uh, infected um, erythrocyte into this plane. It's a very important mechanism to avoid uh, their uh, destruction into this plane. So we have uh, a lot of uh, pathogenetic mechanisms, obviously the, the discharge of hemolytic uh, toxin, the oxid oxidative injury uh, of uh, red blood cells, the extra and intravascular hemolysis that explain the hemolytic anemia. Obviously, the main mechanism is the direct parasite destruction of red blood cells. But please, again, remember, this is an Italian st study of uh, uh, 20 years ago by Furlanello and uh, co-authors that demonstrate that in a group of dogs, the main uh, clinical pathological alteration was not the anemia, but the uh, piastrinopenia. So the platelets, uh, uh, the platelet, the low number of platelets. So what I would like to stress is that you have not only to focalize on the anemia. Yes, anemia is a very important uh, feature that we obviously uh, uh, we find in uh, uh, most dogs, but sometimes you can have a different mechanism, you can have a, a co-infection, you can have a chronic cases in which the anemia is not so evident. Important again to recognize the zoonotic risk of babesiosis. Here uh, you can see the list of babesia that infect humans, like Babesia divergens, Microte, uh, Mantorum, Duncani, or other miscellaneous. But till now we have no canine Babesia species that has been implicated as a, a zoonotic. However, uh, uh, some cases of Babesia gibsoni in humans uh, are actually under investigation. So probably in the near future, we can assist also uh, to the discovering of uh, some animal, uh, and in this case, uh, to dog Babesia also as a zoonotic risk for humans. 
uh, what about the human babesiosis? They can cause acute respiratory distress syndromes or uh, disseminate intravascular coagulopathy, uh, coma, splenic rupture. So uh, the human babesiosis has a very important fatality rates that is estimated among uh, six and nine percent. I would like also to present a clinical case. Uh, she is Biba, uh, a dog of uh, my friends, is a, a dog of uh, veterinary. You know that strange cases usually happen to the dogs of friends or to the dogs of veterinarians is typical. Uh, Biba was adopted uh, uh, when she was uh, one year uh, old and uh, she was adopted from the vet uh, in a public kennel. And after the adoption, she was diagnosed for Radisson disease. And at the age of two years, she resulted also serologically positive to Babesia uh, and to Lesmania and to Rickettsia uh, during the routine uh, clinical and biochemical follow-up that the vet performed yearly. And what the vet found was mild anemia, not regenerative anemia, and thrombocytopenia uh, with no other clinical signs. And she treated uh, for leishmaniosis and also for rickettsiosis by uh, doxycycline. And she had the normalization of both parameters after one month of treatment. But, and it's classical of, uh, of uh, co-infection, Biba relapses after three months. So she was referred to our teaching uh, hospital last year in April for laminis and the generalized uh, painful joints, uh, again with mild anemia and thrombocytopenia. Probably thrombocytopenia is a marker of uh, canine vector bone diseases. It's common to all canine vector bone diseases. Obviously, we have a lot of other uh, not infectious diseases that can cause uh, thrombocytopenia. However, please remember that thrombocytopenia is an important marker of all the canine vector bone diseases. So we performed again. Uh, uh, an immune fluorescence for Lesmania. And we found a mild title of one to 320. Our cutoff is uh, one to 80. And we had also a PCR positive, real-time PCR positive in uh, lymph node aspiration for Lesmania. And we checked again for Babesia, first for uh, with the uh, PCR for Babesia species, and then by sequencing, uh, we uh, identified Babesia gibson. So what about the treatment of Biba? Because Biba, uh, I, uh, I say that she's also in treatment for the Addison disease with the desoxycortone pyrrolate, but actually, she is treated by alloporinol for the maintenance of the treatment for leishmaniosis. And previously, we uh, treated by atovaquone, uh, uh, 13 milligram uh, for kilogram uh, every uh, eight hours, uh, uh, three per day, uh, plus azithromycin, 10 milligram, one per day for 10 days. And previously, uh, she was also treated by clindamycin, metronidazole, and doxycycline. Why? Because we have no definitive treatment for the small form of Babesia, but I will discuss over there. But I would like also um, to um, give you some information about clinical pathological data of Biba because look at, we have a mild anemia. Here you can see uh, the, the result with no regenerative 
anima. Why? Because she has both leishmaniosis that usually causes um, bone marrow depression and babesiosis. So we have not Biba has not the possibility of a good degeneration because she is also lesmaniotic. So please remember that not always we have uh, what we read in a book. Babesiosis causes regenerative anemia. It is not always true because it depends from the clinical case. But please, again, thrombocytopenia, that is a marker common in all the canine back thrombone uh, diseases. Obviously, in uh, the urine, uh, you can see here the presence of uh, blood and uh, red blood cells in the sediment of the urine. So it is important for diagnosis to have all the whole uh, dog's history, uh, very, very important, the epidemiological data in the area to recognize what kind, what uh, kind of species we have in our area, but obviously all the, the history of dogs for the travel that the dogs uh, may, may have with the, the owner and uh, obviously a complete clinical examination together with uh, a complete clinical pathological uh, data to check for concurrent uh, diseases. Very important also to, to know if uh, the dog was uh, submitted to splenectomy or for example for trauma or for other in, in disease or neoplastic disease, for example, or if the dog was submitted to blood uh, transfusion, because uh, remember, it could be a way of uh, transmission. But again, if the dog was adopted from a kennel, or, or uh, if the dog uh, received bites by another dog, because uh, Babesia gibsoni, uh, uh, could be transmitted by bites. And uh, what about the definitive diagnosis? First, uh, always perform a blood smear from uh, the capillary vein. And we have a different approach to the definitive diagnosis, but please, uh, for babesiosis, the molecular approach is uh, the the target. We have uh, always performed the molecular approach for uh, the definitive diagnosis of babesiosis. Why? Uh, because serology has uh, numerous uh, limits. Uh, first, uh, they are not able uh, to detect, for example, uh, acute cases. They could have some importance to detect chronic infected dogs with the low parasitemia, but uh, we have to uh, be sure that uh, they are not anamnestic uh, antibodies. So we have to identify the, uh, the agent. So the molecular approach uh, by uh, peripheral blood is very, very, uh, important and we also we have also to identify the species because the treatment is very different if we discuss of a large babesia of or of a small babesia so first we have to approach for uh, we, we can approach uh, for the identification of the presence of, of uh, Babesia by using uh, a PCR for the identification of Babesia species, then we can use another specific PCR or sequencing to identify the, the species. 
and because uh, the the main species that we have all around the world actually are uh, uh, Babesia uh, um, Gibsoni and Babesia uh, Canis or Babesia uh, Vogelai, we can first rule out for the presence of Babesia. So the first approach is to uh, try to rule out or not the presence of Babesia. Obviously, if you have uh, a positive test, you are sure that you are in presence of Babesia. Then you have to identify the, the, the Babesia. And it is very, very important. Obviously, all the other features, so uh, the history, the uh, clinical examination, clinical pathological data are very, very important. You can perform blood smear evaluation, but the definitive diagnosis is by molecular approach. And it is very important because uh, we have to, um, to identify the, um, the true uh, treatment for depending on the species that we, we have in front of us. Uh, because also, we have also to, to recognize that to date, no treatment of Babesia infection uh, is able to uh, completely eliminate the parasite from the body. And also the owner uh, should know that uh, uh, when we are treating a dog for Babesia, uh, we have the risk of relapses of the diseases. And also uh, we have to, to say to the owner that uh, treated dogs may become a source of infection and potential reservoir of the parasite. Uh, it, it happens mainly for small Babesia forms in which we have a frequent uh, recurrence of the disease after uh, the, the treatment. Even uh, when the dogs appear clinically healthy, it's very, very important to to stress with the, the owner that relapses uh, may always uh, occur. Obviously, we know that antibabesia drugs are able to improve the clinical uh, condition. And uh, uh, we know also that some dogs may result negative after treatment because of low, very, very low parasitemia. However, uh, good PCR usually are able also to detect uh, dogs with low parasit parasitemia. So uh, it is for this reason, also for this reason, is very important to approach by um, PCR all the dogs with the suspicion of uh, Babesia. What about drugs? Um, we have two different treatments um, depending on the species. We know that imidocarb propionate uh, is uh, the drugs that usually we use for large form of Babesia. So Babesia rossi, Babesia canis, Babesia uh, vogelii, and the therapeutic dosage is 6.6 uh, uh, milligram uh, kilogram of body weight uh, for intramuscular uh, administration, also by uh, subcutaneous administration in two doses uh, at 14 days of intervals. But we know also that imidocarb may have uh, um, some side effects. Uh, the main, the painful, uh, uh, injection uh, with the uh, ulcer or necrosis, but also some uh, parasympathico-mimetic uh, symptoms. So we can uh, premedicate by atropine at the standard dosage uh, to avoid uh, some vagal uh, symptoms. And again, imidocarb propionate is not effective against small Babesia, and particularly 
against Babesia uh, gibson. Uh, we have also in some country, uh, the, the minazen acetovate that has a good efficacy, both for large and small forms of Babesia uh, at the dosage of uh, three, uh, five milligram, or we have also uh, an alternative protocol of two milligram kilogram in three uh, subcutaneous application every uh, um, two days plus clindamycin, but please remember that diminazen uh, has severe, very severe side effects, uh, mainly neurological uh, uh, side effects. So is out of the market in many, many countries. So diminazen uh, is, is strong, strongly limited from its toxic, toxicity. So, what about the small form of Babesia? Uh, we approached uh, Babesia Gibsoni treatment by Atovacuan uh, at the, this therapeutic dosage of uh, 13.3 milligram kilogram of uh, body weight orally. It's important to administrate Atovacuan uh, with the fatty meal because there is a good uh, absorption of uh, the drug every eight hours for 10 days. And we have to combine with the uh, azithromycin uh, uh, dosage of 10 milligram of body weight orally uh, every uh, 24 hours, uh, the same for 10 days. What are the pitfalls of this kind of treatment? that in many countries, uh, Atovacuan is uh, just uh, licensed for the, um, as anti-malaria uh, drugs that is largely used in humans, but is uh, combined with the proguanyl hydrochloride. And uh, uh, it is the only form that we have in many uh, countries. So we have not the, uh, the possibility to have uh, only the atomic one. And we have also to remember that uh, is, uh, it has a high cost and it can also give resistance. Uh, there are some description of resistance to atomic one. So, but till now, uh, the combination of atomic one and azithromycin is uh, considered the treatment of choice for Babesia uh, gibsoni infection. Again, treatment does not allow a definitive clearance and relapses may occur. But please, again, when relapses occur, please check for other pathogens. This is one of the main causes of uh, the relapses. We can also use uh, supportive care, depending obviously from the clinical condition of dogs. Here you can see the list of uh, oxygen, blood transfusion, fluid therapy, obviously. And I would like also to stress that also in um, babesiosis, like in other canine vector bone diseases, the treatment by corticosteroids is controversial. We have no uh, definitive um, studies about uh, the treatment by uh, corticosteroids. Obviously, in some cases, we can use also corticosteroid treatment. Uh, what about prevention? Uh, it's important to avoid, obviously, the tick bite by using uh, pyrethroids, isoxazines, or obviously to kill all the ticks on the dog. Uh, but please also avoid blood transfusion from infected dogs or check blood product by PCR before transfusion in endemic area and also avoid mating with infected dogs. And we know also that uh, in Europe or in some countries, uh, there is a, a vaccine that was developed for large form of Babesia, but this vaccine does not prevent infection. It could be only useful to prevent some severe form 
of a large Babesia. In conclusion, canine babesiosis is caused by different and divergent pathogens that induce uh, diseases with high degree of uh, similarity. Uh, the genus Babesia will probably be split into more than one genera in the near future, and identification of the species by PCR, the species responsible for the infection is imperative. I would like also to show you a very nice picture of uh, the inner part of uh, the historical building of my faculty. We are in an ancient claustrum of the 16th uh, century, and uh, uh, I am proud to belong to uh, the, the oldest uh, public university in the world because uh, the Federico II University was found, founded in uh, the beginning of the Middle Age uh, by the King Federico II. Thank you for your kind attention. I am uh, ready for your question. Thank you so much, Dr. Oliver. That was really, really interesting and so informative. Um, I love that picture at the end though, really, really beautiful. Um, thank you for all of the information and uh, the excellent explanations. I'm sure that everybody found it as fascinating as I did. And we do have some questions as well, which I will present to you. The first question is, does transmission during a dog fight need a bloody wound or just mucosal contact? Yes, it is uh, not clear, not clear, because, for example, uh, Biba was one of the examples that I presented. Uh, the, um, the owner, uh, she was a veterinarian, and also uh, the, um, when uh, the um, people uh, that uh, manage, managed the kennels, they did not remember a clear wound on the dog, not a clear exchange of blood among fighting dogs, but Biba was infected by Babesia gibsoni. So uh, the, it is very, very interesting um, question because the role of saliva uh, is, uh, is under investigation. Obviously, uh, it's also possible that the dog has a very small bow wound in the moat that we cannot recognize always, but there is not uh, what is clear that we do not need a, a large wound to have the transmission. Thank you. Question two is, do we assume that with Babesia anemia, we must also have IMHA induced by Babesia? Yes, we, we can have uh, hemolytic uh, anemia, uh, obviously, um, and we can have also immune-mediated uh, anemia. Uh, very, very um, important, uh, also severe immune-mediated anemia. And in this case, for example, uh, there are some description of the use of uh, steroids uh, together with the use of uh, etiological treatment for Babesia. And this is one of the example in which steroids therapy uh, could be considered. Great, thank you. Question three is, what is the most pathogenic species of Babesia? Yes, uh, Babesia rossi uh, is the most pathogenic uh, in main cases. Um, it causes a fatal form of uh, acute or hyperacute form of babesiosis. However, uh, this is the, the one of the example in which the vaccine was developed for this form. But uh, fortunately, we have uh, the, um, uh, the presence of Babesia rossi only in some part of South Africa countries, so it's very localized. And uh, it is uh, uh, in, uh, I remember that uh, 
also um, there are fatal description of Babesia canis uh, during the 70s, uh, but now um, probably also uh, because the immunological states of our dogs are better, uh, we have few cases of severe cases of uh, during uh, Babesia canis. So in this moment, the most important severity is uh, for uh, some cases of uh, Babesia gibsoni, uh, mainly when um, it happens together with other pathogens. Great, thank you. Question four is, can I use doxycline to treat all types of Babesia? Yes, uh, thanks for questions, because um, doxycycline is considered uh, a second choice uh, treatment, uh, and it could be combined also with uh, some antibiotics like uh, clindamycin, for example, or azithromycin for small form of Babesia, but is not the first line treatment. Uh, also for a large form of Babesia, uh, it has uh, some clinical, good clinical effect, but it is not a good treatment for Babesiosis. So my answer is, if you have no other treatment available in your country, you can use doxycycline, but uh, it is not uh, an effective treatment. It is considered um, a sec secondary choice treatment. Thank you. That leads quite nicely onto one of the other questions we had, which was, could treatment with enrofloxacine, metronidazole, and doxycline for six weeks for Babesia gypsoni help? Yes, it's the same, um, uh, I probably in one of the, my last slides, I presented that are, um, you, you can also find in literature, some example of alternative treatment to atovacuan and uh, azithromycin because uh, it is not easy to find the atovacuan in some countries. So the combination with the different antibiotics is uh, um, also considered, but uh, we have no uh, enough study to demo that demonstrate uh, their efficacy. Great, thank you. That's really helpful. Uh, question six is, do you find that thrombocytopenia is also associated with increased platelet volume in these cases? What if we get platelet clusters in blood smear and low platelet counts on the automatic equipment? How do you value these findings? Yes, obviously, uh, all the trouble of the, um, uh, the platelets, not only uh, thrombocytopenia, but also uh, the, uh, the different uh, distribution uh, in, uh, in the smear, uh, the formation of aggregate, uh, also the different um, shape and dimension of uh, the, the platelets are, um, and are uh, considered in um, uh, when you approach uh, the, the lecture of uh, your, your, um, um, uh, your, your blood uh, smear or your um, result of um, the, the um, blood examination, because th there are also some trouble uh, in uh, due to the chronic inflammation and the production of uh, uh, a lot of cytokine uh, to the bone marrow. So we have also some example of bone marrow uh, dysplasia uh, during babesiosis uh, and other canine vector borne diseases that uh, may explain the trouble in all uh, the, um, the lineage of the platelets. So not only thrombocytopenia, but the other um, the trouble in the platelets. 
Great, thank you very much. And the last question, question eight, last question for this evening is, if the dog is infected again, do we apply the same protocol? Yes, because we have no other um, effective uh, treatment. So uh, obviously um, we can approach in some cases with um, different dosages, but usually my, my suggestion is to approach with the standard treatment in case of uh, relapses. Obviously, if you have uh, uh, numerous uh, relapses, please check also for other uh, concomitant diseases. Great. Well, thank you very much again, Dr. Oliver. That was really, really interesting, very, very informative. Um, and I know that uh, everyone really enjoyed it. Uh, I would like to thank everybody for their interest and their attendance this evening. It was great to have you all along. Thank you for your questions. As mentioned earlier, any questions that weren't answered live today will be presented to Dr. Oliver. He will write down his answers and these will be sent to you in a few days time. After today's discussion, I would encourage everyone to look into Biogel's canine babesiosis pack. This includes the brand new Babesia PC run detection kit, Biogel's case study on vector borne diseases, and five important points to consider before testing for canine babesiosis. You can access this content for free at biogel.com. You can also head to the website to ask any further questions about today's discussion or about any of Biogel's other products. Their experts are available and happy to help. Your attendance certificates will be sent in a few days time along with all of the questions from today's uh, webinar. And we hope that you will join us again in future for future discussions about many interesting topics. We look forward to seeing you then. Thank you again to everybody. Have a great evening and we will see you again soon. Bye-bye.